Well, hello everybody, and we are here with us Real Estate Com Dallas. Uh, my name is Yulia Brown, and I'm here with Ms. Jennifer Loading, and we have a very special guest, Ms. Alicia Bush with Treasured Vessels Foundation. Thanks for having me. Welcome. Welcome. So, uh, a little bit backstory. Alicia and I, we met each other a long time ago, and I remember when she was barely starting her journey with Treasured Vessels, and I would like for everybody to hear more about it and how you got inspired to do this? Yeah, it's always such an interesting um, question because, you know, I, I think a lot of us would expect someone to say, well, as a child, I experienced this or I knew someone that had experienced this and um, that just really wasn't the case. This was more of a faith journey for me. I was in the middle of my career in medical device in the operating room and I truly enjoyed i um, still miss just being in the hospital even with COVID-19 I remember going through H1N1 and and just all the there's just something about the healthcare um, uh, space that I, I really enjoyed and I did really well in it um, we had a third surprise child and I don't know it just something started things started to change um, maybe in my mindset I'm not really sure but it was more, you know, like, what am I here for outside of being in the middle of my career, outside of being a mother and a wife of all those things that have so much extra time on my hands. Um, what, what am I, what am I here for? So I just went on this faith journey of 11 months of just fasting and praying and just um, tapping into the community, asking people questions about what they're passionate about, never really having a sex trafficking bend at all, just being completely open to whatever it is that I felt like was, I could be drawn to and I could be really passionate about. Um, and I'd come up with a lot of ideas and one Friday night, my husband looked at me and I, or I looked at him and said, Oh, I can do this and I can do this. And I can do this. And he was like, mm -hmm, okay, honey, I believe you can do all of those things. Anything you've ever put your mind to, you could do. He said, but, but I don't think that's it. As I'm going through this laundry list of items that have, again, nothing to do with sex trafficking. He said, what are you going to do with your hands? You think that's a typical, maybe a, like a male response as far as, you know, they like to use their hands and just his idea of, are you going to dig a well or are you going to you know, build something, you know, build a school and we're international missionaries. And so those kinds of things we do overseas and you think about, and I'm like, I don't know. And so that's in my prayers that night, I said, Lord, what am I going to do with my hands? And, um, I woke up the next morning, it's November 7th, and God said to me very clearly and plainly, you will build an aftercare facility for girls rescued from sex trafficking locally. So not overseas, but right here. And that was my question of, is that a thing? Is sex trafficking, is that like a need? Is a home? Like, uh, so I started calling other nonprofits or doing some research, calling law enforcement. Okay, so when you... When someone is recovered and I read about them in the news and the trafficker goes to jail, where, where does the, the, um, the individual go that was rescued? And they all kind of him hauled around and say, you know, Alicia, we don't have a place. We may take her to a domestic violence shelter. We may take him to a homeless shelter. But in terms, if you're asking for a very specific solution for trafficking victims, um, to go and heal long term, if going home isn't an option, there's not a solution. I said, okay. So that was just a confirmation. My husband is a cust is a custom home builder um, and a developer, so he's got the sticks and bricks side of of what we do. And then I have that healthcare background of just understanding um, clinic, clinically what needs to happen. How do we create an evidence-based outcomes program? How do we uh, measure what we're doing is effective? And that started the journey um, January. So that was in November. So that started in, in January. Uh, we created Treasured Vessels Foundation um, with a mission to serve not only the minors, it is also developed into serving the adult young ladies um, even though we know about 50% of the population, uh, 30 to 50 can be males that are also victims of trafficking. And um, that's really kind of been our lane for now. 
And um, so four years later of just building uh, the, the understanding of who we're serving, how we're going to serve, meeting with survivors that have taken a leadership um, and mentorship uh, position to say, hey, if I was to have re need resources at your facility, this is what I would need. This is what I need now. Um, CPS, if we were going to refer a child to you and give and and allow you to have this child for an extended period of time without their parents, these are the requirements that we require as CPS. And learning from other nonprofits, okay, what are you doing to serve this population? Well, we're on the awareness side. We're on the prevention side. We're on the um, we can't rescue law enforcement rescues. However, we give data to law enforcement to help them do the rescuing. So everybody just kind of having their lane, gathering all that information and seeing this huge gap consistently every time we have this conversation of, man, but you're doing all this work and if they need some place to go once they've been recovered, what's the point? Um, so just for, for further fueling my passion uh, for what I was created to do, um, and then this January, we opened our doors to serving 18 to 24 year olds. Um, we have individuals right now in our care that um, are one of our criteria, criteria is um, trafficking has to be a part of their story. Um, we don't serve just at risk youth or substance abuse or domestic violence, understanding that many of those things can be a part of it, but that, that trafficking piece is very specific in how they need, um, how they require a, a very unique level of support in our program. So um, our young ladies, uh, surprisingly, when we got applications, they were pregnant. That wasn't on our criteria uh, list, it, uh, but we called some partners that we had built over the last four years and said, hey, this is your expertise. We got, we don't wanna say no, but we can't provide, we don't have the bandwidth to add that to our um, level of support. And they said, you don't worry about it. We'll take care of the pregnancy piece. Um, you, you guys just continue doing your program. We called a substance and alcohol abuse uh, support group um, that has a program. They also provide the substance and alcohol support. Um, we have a licensed professional counselor. We've learned over the last four years that that is such a critical piece to have a counselor that specializes not only in um, trauma, EMDR, but also she is very passionate about uh, learning more about um, sex therapy and, be, and being certified in sex, uh, sex therapy because that's often sometimes something that we forget to talk about in their healing journey mm -hmm. that they're hypersexualized and they've gone through this and they've had like sometimes that can distort and confuse their sexuality and how they feel about sex and so individual counselor and they have individual counseling every week counselor that's on staff group therapy psychoed um as as well as the support of our program director and our residential assistants that are in the home, helping them get a birth certificate if they were missing their birth certificate when they came in. Um, do they have a GED? If not, how do we help with that? Our, our girls actually do, our current residents do. Um, we are have already enrolled one in um, college, so she'll be starting in the fall. Um, um, when last week got glasses, she hasn't had glasses in a very long time, and their prenatal care um, so it's been an amazing journey, not only learning about the trauma, but then also the impact that we're having on our residents um, generationally. As one of our residents just said to me, she said, oh, Miss Alicia, and she was holding her, her little belly, you know, and said, you've not only changed my life, but you've changed generations to come. And you just go, wow, this is not, this is just not like about the one life. It's about all the, like how, because we always say it's for the one, right? It's just for the one. Um, but you just really start thinking about the magnitude of that and how um, impactful that one decision of saying, I'm going to find out what my purpose is. There's a yes in my heart to wherever God is calling me. And I mean, who knew I would be called into it? Uh, a space that has been 
the most rewarding, but yet the most very, very challenging to just learn of their plight and learn of things that are happening right here. Wow. I have a question for you because obviously this organization, you guys are relying heavily on donations. So how big is your staff that's working with you? Because you were talking about all of these. It's incredible what you guys are doing. So what does your staff look like? So when we first started, um, I'm, I'm a full-time volunteer and I'll remain so until we can find um, an executive director that has more um, business acumen than, than I. Um, I have the passion in the heart. Um, but we, we do have big dreams for where we want to take this organization um, to the nations. Um, so we have, everybody's been a 1099 prior to this. So a director of communications has been with us for three years. Um, if you've already seen some of her ways that she communicates um, via email right. and social media and those things. Um, and, and we have a lot of um, millennials and Gen Zs. So I've loved that part because they really help me see things through a different lens coming from corporate. Um, and so uh, director of communications, director of community impact, she's out in the community on the fun fundraising side and, and is really um, connecting with the community. And those are like the three of us are mainly outside the home. And then within the home, we have a, a house court, um, kind of a house mom, if you will, that lives there. Um, we also have a um, licensed professional counselor. We also have non-clinical interns. So those are non-paid interns that come in that are have criteria from school. And then any additional hours that they need outside of that, we um, have chosen to pay them rather than hiring additional staff. Right. So they're already in the home and they're already learning great things. Um, and then we have a program director who happens to also be an ICU nurse. So she brings a great deal of, of um, that medical piece right. so with COVID-19, right? She's able to say, hey, these are some of the things that we're doing in the hospital. I want to see them done in the home. We want to make sure that we're checking temperatures and not having vol extra volunteers that aren't needed in the home. Hey, we want to make sure that we're changing the way that we wash our hands, you know? Um, and so that has been um, a tremendous uh just a unique piece that we weren't really looking for in a program director, but she just brings so much value. Um, and then we also have residential assistants. So a lot of times those interns, um, non-clinical interns will turn into residential assistants because they'll love being part of what we're doing and they continue to stay on staff. So we ended up hiring actually three additional uh, residential interns just now and a couple PRN. Um, with their journey, we've learned uh, even since January that here's here's who we have for staff. This is what this is going to look like, and then based on where our residents are and who our residents are, where they are on their journey, and the level of trauma that they've had, there's kind of an ebb and flow as far as support. One individual we had, she needed uh, one on one, twenty four seven care, and we didn't have that in in place. And so we're kind of trying to scramble. I'm showing up going, I'm sorry, I don't know all the things, but I, you, you get me. Um, and then, but we started to kind of buffer and prepare for those moments that we might need. Uh, if we have some suicidal ideation, so thoughts of suicide or someone, an individual that's coming in with, when she's self-harming and we know it, she's currently self-harming, just got out of the hospital. We said, okay, we're gonna need to make sure that we have extra staff that's awake with this individual every 15 minutes is checking on them and making sure that they're safe for a period of time. So we've already started to build those things in just based on our current residents, our applications that we're receiving and what our residents are teaching us about the level of support that they need and how it just ebb and flows. Wow, that's oh, yeah. truly remarkable. And uh, I mean, obviously, huge huge thanks from the bottom of our hearts and a lot of people have this understanding that this kind of trouble hits less fortunate neighborhoods that oh well we live here and here that it will never come to our door or to our neighborhoods what is the experience and what is the um, numbers that you guys have at your disposal how does it really work you know and it's so hard because we've we've always said and we always want to stand on it does affect 
and does have, it has no socioeconomic status. It has no um, cultural boundaries. It, it, it just, it, it can affect anyone from the highest paid to the, you know, lowest. It, it's a lot, of, but we do see a little um, a, a more of an increase in some of those um, impoverished communities where there is an increased vulnerability, meaning maybe mom isn't as present because she is working three jobs. And so maybe boyfriend comes in and boyfriend has um, been abused as a child and abuses the child. Um, and so we, we do see those pieces, but then we've also got, you know, a really wealthy family. Dad travels a lot. Mom is uh, very caught up in her social life and daughter, son meets, you know, son meets somebody gaming. Um, we just had one of these recently. I mean, meet somebody gaming and um, they had built a relationship a friendship for a couple of years. And so the son decides, you know, he just sounds really like a really great friend. My parents are going through a hard time right now. And I'm just going to physically go and see him for the very first time and put the, the young boy in a, in a very, very, very dangerous situation. So it can happen in so many different ways. Um, so we, we, we currently have all of those situations and um, you've got the you've got the boyfriend that is trafficking his girlfriend it doesn't look like the definition of trafficking is he hasn't chained her to a bed and sent all these men into a hotel room that's not what it looked like and so she didn't know what was happening to her was being was trafficking we have one individual whose parents were her traffickers very very influential wow. people very, very well connected. Um, and she did not know because she's been trafficked since she was three. Oh my um, God. And, yeah. you know, and so it's a very, it's so, um, I don't know if fascinating is the word to use, is the proper word to use, but it is fascinating just to hear how unique every one of their stories um, are and how they got to where they are today and where they got, how they even got to us through either law enforcement or a mental health facility um, or a referral from some, some family member that says something is not right. And the, the child, I mean, these individuals are like, I don't know what you're talking about. And not that they're hiding it, but they, the traffickers do such a good making sure that those vulnerabilities are are um, heightened, I should say, and the shame is very, very high, and the the uh, threats are very, very real, um, and then the, also the opportunity for help is non-existent. So they have to, and I mean that's every one of our residents have said. I had no idea that there was an organization like this that provided care like this. So it's it even getting in front of them. Um. Is, is hard, right? Because you aren't, you're like, we provide this service, but if they don't, right. if you're not on their social media feed, you know, or however, however you're getting the word out that you're here to offer support, um, how would they know? Right. Who do they trust? Right. Yeah. Wow, that's hard. Definitely mind boggling. Yeah. So do you, or do you have another job, Alicia, or is this what you do this pretty much full time? It sounds like, I mean, it's quite extensive. So it sounds like it could be a, a lot of time, you know, commitment for you. So is this your thing or do you have other things you work on too? Um, so my kids are homeschooled. Okay. And um, that so that's like, <laughs> it, you know, and I, and I really can't say that I do a lot. Everything they do is on the internet, but that's just I, it's kind of, there's another, piece to that. Um, right. We uh, have a, an au pair um, from Columbia and so she is helps in so many ways to, to help us with me with that. But you know I actually tried to go back into medicine as a 1099 selling you know I have such good relationships. I was sure. really successful doing it. I thought, oh I could actually go in and I could make some money and that could generate right. fundraising and generate and it just 
as wild as it's as it as it may sound, even this is literally a full time job. It's wild right. before how it was a full time job, and then now we we open our doors, and my husband was like, "I thought you were going to be less busy." I'm like, "You know, what? I think I did too." What is happening? No. Now yeah. that you have a residence <laughs> and a residential yeah. home, and so. And our staff, I'm, I'm, I, I bring that corporate um, level of excellence with me, and I don't know how to not have policies and procedures for every stinking thing, and um, and then the programming piece. What's our program going to look like? Will you develop right. it, and I'll proofread it, and then, and oh, and then you got to have a board. I'm like, for what? Why do we have a board? You know? And then I've learned, okay, now, and I'm board chair. And, yeah. And then you got to have a committee. Board committees for them to I'm like, oh my word <laughs> it's a it's a process no and I get it I like I said I've homeschooled my kids before mine are all bigger now so I get it I can respect that I understand it it is a job even with them doing things online you are still a full-time mom and you still have to be there to guide and support make sure they're doing what they need to do and yeah I mean I've I've worked the entire time my oldest is 23 my youngest is 15 I've worked the entire time that my kids have pretty much since my oldest was two and I've been an entrepreneur, I've done that. So it is anytime you're doing something, whether it's one project or two, it doesn't matter. You're busy as a mom and that is another, another. So I was not making light of that. That's what I was saying. To me, it sounds like oh, that takes yeah. a lot, but I couldn't imagine you having time to be able to take on more endeavors, you know? So, but I think it's great. I, I admire what you're doing and it's much needed and, I, I definitely, I mean, human trafficking is, is a really big thing. And, and all of a sudden, it's so incredible to me how we're hearing about this so, I don't even know if incredible is the right word, but I'm just saying we're hearing about it so much. Yeah. I mean, even like I, I, I was driving through, I don't know where I was going. Oh, when we went to pick my middle up from Arkansas, she was at Southern Arkansas. We went to bring her back home from college. And even, you know, you go into the, the rest stops and they've got posters in there yeah. for, it's in all of them. So I never, you know, a few years ago, I hadn't really heard about that right. so much. Now you hear about it a lot. So it's a big yeah. thing. Well, and I think, you know, kind of back to your point of like what, um, I, I think my husband and I both thought, I mean, he was like, oh, well, you can just start this thing and you can just do this thing and still work, you know, right. your job. And this is a, we're going to have bake sales and it's going to be amazing. Um, and, and then you just kind of go, when you start something, you're going, Oh my gosh. And I had no idea. And then this, this nonprofit piece of, I don't have anything to sell. Right. In terms of that, that, that physical tangible thing or that service or whatever that people were like, Oh, now, I mean, before it was, you have, I have a product that you like, you, mm -hmm. you give me money. I give you a product. Right. Now you donate and I give you a high five. Right. I'm like, this is a whole different like uh, way of doing things. And then now you're talking about a subject that quite frankly scares the living daylights out of every person that I speak with. Mm -hmm. And it scares children. It scares parents. It reminds parents of their own child abuse because child abuse being a part of it. It also, right. we have to dig into pornography and the addiction around that and how it fuels human trafficking and or why do we have the supply? Well, it's because we have the demand. Right. It starts to touch on like a lot of sensitive subjects to where people are going, oh, I don't know that I want to learn more about this. Alicia, will you just please stop talking? I, <laughs> I love it. I think you're brave. It's hard Thank to do this. But you know, you I, when you're talking about all this, like doing this stuff, this is something you're passionate about. And I always believe that you know, yes, because I kind of do the same thing and I'm not always really offering a service where I'm getting paid for it. It's more of a passion of why I do what I do. And so I can understand that. But I also feel like when you're fueled by passion, that's where your heart is. And when you're fueled by it, you get rewarded in so many ways yes. that you can't really put that dollar on it. You know what I mean? Like you can't put yeah. that price tag on it. And when you were talking earlier about the whole like generational thing, I always talk about like, you know, we always think what we do is like a needle in a haystack, but really what we do is, is a lot because it affects a lot of people going forward. So a hundred percent, I think what you're doing is incredible. I admire it. And it, it's, yeah, it's awesome stuff. It's, it's, awesome. it's just, it's been an honor. I mean, just even talking about one of the ways to, 
that we're, I've, I've been wanting to fundraise uh, just to create a sustainable nonprofit is not going out into the community and, and always doing a gala and fundraising and, and grant writing and all that, but also having a for-profit component thinking that my parents are entrepreneurs, my husband is an entrepreneur and going, okay, what is something that we can, um, here I am creating another job for myself. Um, but I, that's kind of what I see as a vision of, Hey, what product can we sell? Like a Tom shoe model, buy a pair, give a pair. Right. Something. So I've, you know, been talking with different, um, kind of investors and things just to find out what would be an attractive model that, had that philanthropic um, portion of what we were doing. So, so an investor doesn't feel like here I'm donating this, but I'm actually investing this, but I'm not only investing, but I'm giving it to a greater cause as well and forwarding the mission. So that is kind of where we are in our journey as we begin to expand and with COVID and donations are down um, as far as, you know, people losing their jobs and, and, and things, we also we still have residents so tapping into saying okay we're not going to continue doing things that we've always done let's think outside of the box we, we even made masks started our survivors making masks and just going okay that's that's giving back to the community as well the community that's poured into us let's give back to them and um, and i think that that will us as entrepreneurs and and as we continue to say hey we can do things different and we've done it before and um, will really carry us through this season that is so unique love it wow that's that's phenomenal and also if someone wanted to donate where do they go and how can they contribute to your organization yeah so um on our website we also have an app called treasure vessels foundation um, rather than tbf and i say that because i know that that's the name of the organization but most people refer to it as TBF. So we have an app that, sh that, that pushes out notifications when we're having um, fundraising opportunities. But just simply on, on the web, one of the things that we're trying to uh, generate is more monthly donors. So we're, we're consistently having that monthly donation so where we know where we are in our budgeting. Um, so that's just at treasuredvesselsfoundation.org forward slash donate. And, um, and then obviously we have Facebook doing fundraisers. Um, Facebook, however, takes 5% of each birthday fundraiser. It's great um, to kind of cast a wider net, but two challenges with that we found is the 5% that Facebook takes. Um, but also we can't connect with, our, um, with the people that give. We don't know who gives. Um, we can't say thank you. You know, sometimes they say you're only as good as your database. Right. And so we did, we also can't build our database. Um, so those are some of the ways that we say if people are going to donate, just go online, but go straight to us. And if you even don't want that transactional percentage, um, our address is on there as well. Fantastic. Well, certainly thank you so much for appearing in our show today. And thank you for giving us all of this valuable information from what I Remember in the past, Texas has a very gruesome statistics. We are in a second place after California on sex trafficking. And I really hope that all of the numbers will just start decreasing because this is just pure evil. Yeah, agreed. Well, thank you all for having me. And Absolutely. thank you for all you do. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Alicia. Yeah, thank, thank you all. Thank you. And uh, this was As Real As They Come Dallas. Thank you for watching.